Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Gotham City. I'm your host, Levi Rosman. This is a podcast where I talk to people who live in the chess world on the 64 squares and also beyond them. And in this episode, I am excited to have a conversation with Maxime vachel Legrave. He is a French super grandmaster. He became a grandmaster when he was just 14 years old. He has won dozens of chess tournaments throughout his career. He holds the seventh highest ever rating of all time with 2,819 classical rating points. And he is the current reigning defending Blitz champion of the world. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Thanks for joining. Uh, it's amazing uh, to get to meet you. Obviously, I have covered uh, a lot of your games um, and I have uh, a little bit of a rivalry, so to say, with the, with the French chess audience, but um, super, super excited to have you on. Thanks for making time. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I uh, wanted to start with the fact that you are the reigning Blitz champion of the world. Uh, and that's a really fascinating tournament. It's probably, in my opinion, along with the World Rapid Championship, kind of the best way to end the year, like the calendar of chess. Uh, so I wanted to get your thoughts on just the whole event. I mean, how, how, how it was with, with COVID being a problem, how it was playing the, the playoff, and just how does it feel to be a, a world champion in a format of chess? Uh, yeah, I do agree, first of all, that it's great to have this at the end of the year. At first, I was like a bit irritated with the schedule because, of course, it means Christmas, you're not going to be with your family and so on. But uh, in the end, I think it's a format that works. Um, that means we also get some spotlight uh, at the end of the year compared to maybe other sports. And in general, it's uh, all good for, for the audience who is uh, relatively free to, to follow what is one of the most exciting events for sure. Um, now, there could be a few questions about the format, but it's been uh, installed for uh, 10 years now. I mean, the idea of playing uh, straight 20 one round of blitz and 15 rounds of rapids. It's pretty exhausting. It, in general, uh, I think it's fine. So, you know, this is my opinion from at the top of my head. It's just that those three days of rapid, uh, five games can last, uh, can be, make for a pretty long day if things are, are not uh, organized like uh, work clock. Um, so then I started pretty badly and in general I, I felt like I was not playing uh, like in my best uh, years of rapid and blitz I think in 2015 I was playing uh, really great in, in rapid and blitz and this year it felt like a, a struggle for the first few days even the first day of blitz was, was a bit of a struggle uh, but then on the last day so yeah everything happened we had this um, COVID situation, which uh, like could have happened uh, before, but uh, it only happened on the last day. And at first, uh, I never thought that uh, we would be finishing the tournament because I thought we would have to, to test more or less everyone and that it would take a long time that many players would uh, actually be tested positive. Um, and sure enough, like once we all went back home, uh, like there were five, ten percent of the players who, who tested positive, uh, from what I know. So, yeah, things were definitely hectic, but at the same time, uh, you know, Phil had to make a decision, like whether to to hold it. Um, so I think it was just chaotic. But in the end, after one hour. We were told that um, that we would resume, um, and yeah, I mean, for me it was like I was thinking, should I like be following everything that's happening? It's pretty crazy, sort what is happening, but at the same time, I should also keep uh, some energy, like uh, some focus. Uh, so in the end, I got help, like first game against uh, of the day with Boris Gelfand. It went not so great, but then I managed to defend and I got this uh, 
uh, this help in the fact that Boris lost on time uh, from a better position, probably drawn, but still could have been unpleasant. Uh, but these things happen, of course, in Blitz. And then I started playing like my best days in Blitz, like really, um, I was playing great chess. I was being clutch or so, something that uh, people have accused me of not being in the past. So like I bet Levon, who was two points ahead uh, at the moment I played him. So like, yeah, entering the last day, I I didn't think I would have a chance to to actually win it because I was already so far behind Levon, who was playing great chess, uh, far behind some other players. So I thought it would take really a, a great day of blitz for me to, to even have a chance. But then I won against Levon. And then Levon started uh, going crazy, I think. Um, and then yeah, I went down to this last blitz DM with Magnus, which was also so intense. Uh, so like every moment of but it happens like it happens naturally in blitz when you're in good shape then generally every moment that is uh, uh down to uncertainty like the last few seconds uh, where you have to play down to your last instincts uh they will go well for you if you're in good shape and they will go bad if you're in bad shape so that's the natural order of things uh don't ask me why but uh one day you and it happens from one day to the other. So like one day you score really average or even really badly and the other day, the next day you're feeling great. Everything starts to, to pile up uh, on your end. You start to really click and, uh, and I was just on the roll at, at that point. Uh, so then we went into this tie break. Of course, it was a bit sad that Ari Rezaki couldn't join. Uh, but the rules were made that way that only the top two uh, of uh, uh, with um, top two tie breaks who would make it to the playoff. So it was uh, uh, Jan Christoph and me. And yeah, I could feel that, uh, of course, Jan was uh, in front uh, of his arm court in Warsaw. And at the same time, okay, I had a little extra weight. I took every opportunity I could to focus. And I thought this is uh, my time. You know, I've been waiting for for this sort of title for, for so long. So it's my time to really be in a bubble, not think about anything else but, uh, but win. And uh, yeah, I played some of my best chess. Like, so the game I won is probably a game I, I would have been proud to, uh, to win in a classical game. I guess. Do you know the interview that Dubov gave, like after winning World Rapid Championship a few years ago? It's like a pretty famous clip where he says, uh, "In Rapid is the format that he hates the most because you, it's like half serious, half a joke. You don't know if you should party or not, uh, all night or prepare all night." So, yeah. But for, but for Blitz, he says it's just you could do whatever you want. So, I mean, I'm curious what your approach is. Is there no way you can prepare? You just kind of you party all night? Do you sleep all night? What do you do? <laughs> no, for Rapid, I sort of agree, but not in that sense, in the sense that it's hard to know which foot to put on. Like, uh, it's, of course, too quick to have serious long thought as you have in classical chess. But at the same time, it's too slow, uh, too, yeah, too slow to, uh, to be only relying on your instincts to be playing in blitz mode and then you have plenty of time but you get punished so uh, the adjustment in terms of uh, actually taking uh, the right amount of time in rapid is one of the most uh, difficult things to to handle in chess in my opinion uh, but that's also what makes rapid exciting but for a while yeah i was uh, uh, underperforming in rapid, uh, at least compared to Blitz, uh, for this exact reason. Um, and yeah, in terms of preparation for the Blitz, um, so the rapid had actually gone quite badly for me. So I thought I will, I will have training games, uh, and I did, and in a way it helped solving tactics. Uh, but mostly, yeah, I think it's important to have good, a good night of sleep. Um, before an event like where everything goes uh, boom, boom, boom. Like you have first 12 games on the first day, 
second day I had nine games plus uh, three games of tieback, so it also equaled 12 games. So yeah, I think it just really keeping energy because you drain much more energy, uh, even if it takes as much time, I think. Uh, and it's even less time of play. Like if you have a 10 blitz game compared to one classical game of five or six hours, because uh, in a classical game, you have time to reflect on what's happening. You have time to rebound from, uh, you know, from your mistakes, from the changes in the position. You, you can take time to readjust to the situation. In Blitz, there's nothing like that. And whenever you lose a game, you have to refocus, you have to sort of forget it, put it under the table for the next Blitz game. And uh, in every game, there's like moments where you're winning, then suddenly you're lost and you're winning again. And then it ends in a draw and you have to not to be thinking, oh, it's good uh, I was lost, blah, blah. or oh, no, I, I had a win at some point for sure. Uh, and then let it get into your head. So I think this is the most difficult part about Blitz. And of course, that's why we see these crazy uh, streaks sometimes in Blitz, like when everything clicks together, then suddenly you win, you win, you win, you get confidence. And once you get confidence, also your opinion start getting scared. So it's, you know, it's a double effect. And of course, the opposite way around can, can happen. Um, so yeah, for me, it was just, and also, of course, you shouldn't uh, be have too much euphoria if you, even if you're doing good, like, you know, keep things under control because even when things are going extremely well, just one bad game can just derail you. So again, sense of adjustment, sense of equilibrium in, in what you're doing. So. In general, I think that requires tremendous amount of energy. And yeah, I remember like, uh, I remember even Magnus saying this, that after one extremely good uh, day of blitz on his side, he was even too tired to speak. And yeah, I guess that's the way I was uh, feeling afterwards as well, uh, after my, my title. Is it your favorite format, blitz? Or I guess specifically I think so. three two or three zero. Like, do do you care? I mean, three two is the live format, but online it's mostly three zero. So. Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, it's my favorite format. You can you can play so many games, and uh, it brings so much adrenaline, which I'm kind of hooked on. So, so I guess it is my favorite format. Like, uh, um, I mean, I do value classical chess. Uh, even though I'm saying that, but sometimes, you know, it's not for everyone, like classical chess, you don't have, uh, you don't always have uh, six hours to, to spare, or even four hours to spare. Uh, but of course, like many people like it, many people like the way they can uh, think uh, deeper, but, uh, and I do agree sometimes, I mean, uh, there are ideas I found in classical games that of course I would never have found in a blitz game and of course that uh, that do me that does make me feel good but um yeah in a sense i i still prefer playing blitz and you know you you can start a match against anyone casually like uh you know sometimes uh for instance i go to ali reza or ali reza goes to my place and we play boom 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 uh, we play matches up to 10 games whatever some blitz even some bullet and yeah there's just lots of action so you know, everybody likes action, I guess. Yeah, that sounds that sounds tremendously fun. It's true. Uh, you can always boot up, uh, get a chess set, get a clock. You can even come up with some interesting ideas. I I can't imagine uh, I can't imagine some of these behind closed doors matches, uh, even that you you all play in in friendly ways. I'm sure there is even some brilliancies there. Uh, a while ago, I saw some article or some excerpt of some match that. Magnus and Hikaru played after one of these like ra World Rapid or World Blitz events. It was just in some hotel room they played. Until. Yeah, it, it was in Moscow, I think. Even I was there that year, but uh, I wasn't privy to the details. But uh, yeah, they played like Andrew game match. Uh, maybe less. Maybe it was only forty, but like three plus two, some 
uh, but uh, there was something at stake. I mean, I think uh, they they made it. There was something at stake, so that they would both take it seriously. That makes sense. Otherwise, it just seems kind of like a crazy way to spend the evening. Uh, do you? Uh... Well, I mean, we do like this crazy way to <laughs> to spend the evening. But like uh, the facts that it was behind closed doors that uh, uh, showed that they wanted it to be serious. Like because otherwise. It's just a casual end of an elite tournament where, you know, we'll be like generally in St. Louis, that's what happens. We just start to play blitz at the chess club or at one of the chess houses. And yeah, we can go all night even playing big house. Do you, um, like the, the difference in experience playing these live blitz events versus the online ones, uh, for you, is it, a very fun experience to okay maybe not travel far if you have to travel far but just the whole part of traveling you get to see people from around the world is it kind of a mix of chess tournament and also seeing some friends going to some restaurants or do you prefer just booting up the computer you have your two cameras set up you can play a whole event and then you can just go for a walk i mean which one um yeah i know it's uh for me I thought it was great when we had this online event that we would play uh, when there was no other choice. I mean, we were very lucky in that respect, of course, uh, in terms of uh, being able to to keep some chest shape and, of course, earn some money. So this was uh, extremely pleasant. But as for me, for sure, I prefer uh, playing live. Uh, first of all, I think I'm more skilled there. So, of course, it, it, like uh, I why? do think there, there's a real difference. What? Why more skilled? What's? Uh, okay, it's hard to say, but less I'm generally more focused, uh, less prone to tilt, and um, yeah, I guess I have more. I feel more responsibility when I move a chess piece and press the clock than when I, I click on the mouse when you have pre moves and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't enjoy uh, playing online, uh, but the good experience, of course, of uh, uh, being in front of your opponent, you know, uh, seeing uh, his reactions also also makes it better. Uh, and of course, like the yeah, of course, the traveling in itself is not great because uh, it's you know like it's too much traveling uh, to be honest. But there's uh, like I get to meet friends sometimes. I get to uh, to be more social, of course. So even though I I am social in Paris, but uh, uh, yeah, sometimes there's people you you don't get to see so often. You're happy to see them at chess tournaments. So yeah, uh, I like that experience for sure better. One last question. Uh, this one, I guess the the big one in terms of the, the format of those events versus obviously the format of, okay, of course, we know Classical World Championship has its own entire journey, uh, but World Rapid and Blitz, it's just, uh, it's like the Hunger Games, it almost feels like. There's just so many great players and you see guys like Nodirbek who doesn't play in the top circuit of 10, 15, 20 GMs uh, he can rise up and become the champion. Uh, so I, I wanted to know your thoughts as we kind of will talk about the Olympiad after, but you, once you get to the level you're at, which is ninth highest rating of all time, you've been number two in the world, you, for most of the year, especially in slow games, you, you see the same guys over and over and over. Uh, so which, which of those formats do you, do you like? I mean, is, is it kind of nice to play the round robins just because you know everybody so well? Do you prefer a tournament like the World Rapid or World Blitz where you could basically get anybody at any time? Uh, or is it kind of like a hybrid where in Tata Steel you get all the guys, but you get maybe four or five faces that you don't normally yeah. see? Um, I think round robins are generally fine, uh, but I would add something like, and uh, well, it's a bit controversial, but I think there should be some knockout at some point uh, in more or less every event. So I would add playoffs to uh, to this round robin. So should it be either the first two or the first four players? Uh, but just to have uh, like at the end some sort of final 
or semifinals deciding things. So that's one major change, I guess, uh, I would rather have. Uh, so on that note, obviously, you have guessed I'm a fan of knockout events. So that means the World Cup, I think, is one of the best events of the year, for sure. Um, at the same time, I understand it's difficult to organize for obvious reasons, like um, every person who comes there doesn't have a, you know, a, a plane back. So like for logistic re logistical reasons, it's not so easy to do. But at the same time, I see like tennis is doing it very well. Yeah. So uh, there's obviously more money in tennis than in chess, but Still, I don't think we can complain in that sense. I think we have, uh, uh, like, we have lots of money, like in the in the chess scene. I mean, especially of course for elite uh, players. But uh, in general, we like I never had to complain uh, about the money uh, I got in chess. And the second advantage I see is that um, often we see players struggle. Uh, by the end of the tournament. And of course, when you're having the bad tournament, it's, you know, of course, it's also part of the learning experience, you know, to, to know how to handle when things go wrong. But in tennis, when things go wrong, you just go home and move on to the next tournament. Um, so, yeah, I think in that sense, it, it would be better. And it would mean every game has something at stake, which is also something that uh, lacks in chess sometimes. Especially, you know, by the end of the one robins when uh, we tend to see these uh, earlier draws, like uh, either quick repetition or draw where like both players had something to play for, but also didn't feel like playing for. So, uh, yeah, I think that would solve some uh, of the problems. And for the Rapid and Blitz World Championship, like I said, I like the format how it is. Um, one way to maybe try to improve it, also like, I think it's, you know, sometimes there's no need to improve things. So like, I'm not sure it would be an improvement, but again, involve some, um, some playoffs, uh, like, I don't know, instead of um, instead of 15 rapid games, you play, I don't know, 11 or 13. Instead of uh, of 21 blitz, you play maybe 17, and then you have first four moving to a playoff again. I mean, it would make things a bit different. Of course, this blitz competition, I mean, uh, merely Reza, we, we rose up by the end. Uh, so I'm not even sure we would have made top four uh, by 117, but you know this yeah. is not uh, uh, like at least it's a suggestion that maybe maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but uh, I think it's worth a shot. That's super interesting. It's true because actually I was thinking of tennis the whole time, uh, and then you mentioned tennis and. Yeah, I, I don't know. A whole uh, every every US sport has so this playoff uh, thing like NBA, uh, NFL, and so on. Yeah, but I think I think the in in tennis every single tournament is is a knockout. Is, yeah, it's yeah. Like, uh, it's, no, except for the Masters at the end, but uh, yeah, that's one notable exception. And even then, it moves to playoff when players reach the semifinals. Yeah, like I. I play tennis very limited as a hobby, uh, but it's true. I, I don't. I will frequently tune into tournaments in round three or four just because I don't. It's not all over my my Twitter feed or something. Uh, and I go, oh wow, I, I missed some rounds. Let me watch some highlights. And by then, already maybe some good players were just completely knocked out. I mean, just you know, for sure, uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, it does happen at the World Cup um, in chess, like yeah. Okay, last time I was not cut out early at the World Cup was uh, 10 years ago, but this, I mean, last year we saw Ali Reza lose to, to this young kid, Sindarov, who, who played an amazing match, actually, so. Yes, that was the legendary handshake match, right? When they did this thing, like, 10 times. I think there was this highlight. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, well, I was, I was going to ask you some questions about the players from Uzbekistan uh, mm -hmm. when we talked about uh, Olympiad, but... Uh, yeah, I, re I remember. 
Um, World Cup is crazy. It's 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 a super. Fun World event. Cup is just absolutely crazy. Like uh, it's hectic. It can last a month. It is like from uh, my experience well, because I've reached like three semifinals, so I can say it's absolutely exhausting. And you don't want to have something added up to your calendar week later after you finish. But um, it's lots of fun. I think it's like. Of course, candidate, uh, which I haven't mentioned yet, uh, is of course uh, like arguably the most exciting tournament to follow because basically everyone's fighting for the first place, so there's nonstop action. But in terms of format, I think uh, the knockout takes the cake. Like there's always something to follow, uh, and by the end, maybe the players are just a little bit too exhausted. Uh, so maybe the semifinals and finals. Okay, the semifinals have so much at stake that it's exciting, no matter uh, no matter how it goes. But sometimes the finals, uh, you know, is not the real climax, whereas it should be. So, you know, this could be the only thing that could be improved. Uh, but other than that, I think following the World Cup is uh, absolutely great. Like the first World Cup I followed was two thousand five, and or well, like. Just, I mean, it was like not as easy to follow back in 2005 in yeah. terms of internet. I mean, but there was internet so already, so you could follow live action, like just not as good as how it is today. Like this is one of the main improvements we've had in chess in terms of broadcasting. Uh, I mean, it's still not perfect. Um, and one could say surprisingly, but there's just so much action to follow and anywhere. Uh, wanted to, yeah, and we will talk about candidates, of course. Uh, I had um, a few questions for you about uh, Olympiad. So yeah. obviously I saw something. I saw some maybe preview, I don't remember where, and I tried to find it yesterday just so I wouldn't ask you any repetitive questions because I know how this goes. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've maybe- Yeah, yeah, but I, I'm fine uh, answering it again. So like, of course, the obvious question is why am I uh, at home and not, yeah, yeah. Why, and not in Chennai? Yeah, yeah, I mean, right now you should be playing, <laughs> you know, I mean, you guys would have had a crazy team, you, Firuja, uh, and like Etienne is also not there, right? That's like, right, yeah. yeah. So yeah. is there some, is there some bigger story here? Or, I mean, I, I saw, uh, yeah, so what happened? <laughs> no, the main story is, uh, so like when uh, we knew Chennai was going to be a replacement, um, I was like, uh, July, Chennai, <laughs> it's gonna be really hot and so on. Uh, and yeah, I kind of dreaded the climate factor simply. So uh, I talked with the president of French Federation and I was like, of course, if Ali Reza goes, I go, we have a really great team. We have uh, chances to, to do very well. But if for some reason he doesn't want to go, uh, I think I'm going to skip because uh, simply like I was thinking like uh, July, uh, it's going to be really hot. And like, yeah, back then it was like early May. And uh, I mean, temperatures in Chennai were like, uh, if we t talk Fahrenheit, I think it was 110 plus. Mm. So uh, no, it's more reasonable, but uh, I couldn't be sure. Uh, and still, it feels like it's really hot in there. So, um, yeah, I just thought it wouldn't be great for for me in terms of, uh, you know, being in good shape, being at my optimal level. And I thought we had a reasonable chance, chance of winning it with Ali Reza, but without Ali Reza, we, I didn't think we stood the chance. Um, so... Then, of course, I talked with Ali Reza. I asked him if he wanted to go. And yeah, basically, for the same reasons, uh, he didn't really want to go. I told him, OK, you, you call the shots. Like, if you, if you want to go, ultimately, I go. If you don't go, uh, I, I won't go as well. And uh, yeah, this is basically what happened. Got it. Uh, and 
Etienne also, I guess, was it was sort of like if you don't go, yeah, he won't go to... yeah, I okay. guess so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I I'm only asking because I know it seems like, or it's always always seems like of of all the teams, uh, maybe with the exception of Ukraine, obviously. I mean, France is. You guys are a super tight knit unit. Like all of you guys seem on good terms, especially even in pro chess league. You, I don't think you had a single non-French player, if I'm not maybe. Yeah, one. for sure. And one thing that's uh, even better is that, like for a while, we didn't have uh, any new addition to the team. But these days, uh, Jules has been making uh, Jules Moussa has been making lots of uh, improvement. Uh, so it's his second time only being selected, but uh, you know one. he's is an actual uh, great addition to the team and uh, same with uh, Maxime Lagarde so we actually have a, a team like that can uh, definitely win it like we're not on the same level uh, let's say as the US or as uh, Russia as they uh, been able to play but uh, or like we could be comparable to China, China right, as yeah. they play yeah yeah um so yeah it i think it would have been a, a great chance but at the same time i feel like uh, in two years we like ali reza will probably only be better the, the main question is about me but i'm planning to to stay in shape for at least two or four more years so uh, i do hope we'll have a chance to to have the best team uh, for olympiads and clearly like Winning the Olympias would be one of my uh, one major accomplishments uh, from my side. How was that whole process of Ali Reza uh, moving to France? So I don't remember exactly the calendar. I mean, I'm sure you have the same problem in the last from 2020 to 2022. It's all one giant exactly. Blur. Yes. Uh, so when did you know? Like, did I imagine, did, did they get in contact before they even made the move? Did they know somebody in France? I mean, uh, yeah. uh, how so was the whole process? Okay, there were some contacts uh, between the French Federation at the time. Uh, uh, with the president was Bashar Kouatli at the time and uh, Ali Reza, but I was not uh, private to them. Uh, for one simple reason is that uh, uh, it turns out that Basha Kwatli and I are not on the best of terms and that's, uh, you know, a euphemism, let's say. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, I learned uh, that Ali Reza was going to move to France uh, in the World Championship, uh, World Rapid and Beach Championship 2019. So there I talked a bit with Ali Reza and his father as well uh, before they moved and uh, yeah, there was no certainty for me that, uh, like, the certainty was that Aliza was moving to France. I wasn't sure uh, whether he wanted to to play for France, uh, but turns out uh, great that he, he wants to, uh, and he is. He played uh, for us in the European Team Championship, uh, notably. So, like, of course, I mean, a talent like Aliza, how can you turn uh, that down? And uh, yeah, then the process uh, happened quite fast. So uh, I think he got um, his French passport one and a half year later. So I guess it's pretty fast. Uh, I mean, I never had to to deal with uh, administration like to uh, to change passports, but uh, to change nationality. But I guess it's pretty fast for the standards. Like. Uh, the mayor of Chartres, uh, where Ali Reza and his family lives, uh, was very involved uh, in this proceedings. So that's uh, ours, also how you know Ali Reza and his family could accommodate so well in France. And you know, uh, it, like I've seen him uh, yesterday, even and in general, I can say Ali Reza is very happy to to be in France, to be playing for the French team. Uh, also, uh, like. Uh, Everything went so well um, in this respect in the European Team Championship uh, in uh, Slovenia last year. Yeah. Because, uh, like, of course, that was a question mark. Like, uh, how do you fit a new player in the team, um, especially like 
and USA still doesn't speak uh, great French, even though it's improving, but at a slow pace because obviously he has other things to, to work on. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask you how his French is, but I'm assuming everybody just communicates in English. <laughs> um, well, of course, between one another, we would communicate in French, but when Alireza is in, when we're doing some uh, captain meetings or whatever, of course, we would uh, turn to, to English. Uh, we would force him to speak some French as well, but yeah. Uh, some teasing has to happen, especially at your first event with the team. So uh, everything went great. Uh, also, I should mention the team captain for that, like uh, Sebastian Mazet, because um, like there's a, this funny story. So I, I was with uh, uh, one of uh, the federation, like vice president, who was there with us in Slovenia. Uh, and I know him for a really long time. He knows uh, Sebastian for a really long time. And he told me, okay, I knew you guys uh, loved having Sebastian as your captain. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, what is the difference that he makes? Because, you know, he's not like uh, going to have that much inside in terms of chess. Of course, he's a nice guy, but... Uh, but there you could really feel like what ma made him special in terms of, you know, making everyone feel included, feel welcome, uh, creating bonds all around the place. And yeah, this is also one important reason why the French team is uh, thriving so well in terms of, uh, you know, atmosphere and, uh, you know, the go-to team uh, when, uh, when everyone uh, wants to you know, enjoy, uh, enjoy things. One thing that I noticed about, uh, some of these team events, like specifically Olympiad, uh, but I'm sure it's the same in, in, in some of those, uh, other championships is you get, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to ask you on, uh, you, you get a team like Uzbekistan where it, it really feels like the rating does not reflect the skill level which is strange for top-level chess. I mean, here, if I play some closed event, some IM, GM, Norm, Round, Robin, uh, you got someone rated 2150 or 2000, but they're actually 23, 2400 strength. It's much yeah. more common when K factor is lower, I mean, higher and all this stuff. Uh, so is it is it true? Are there more teams and kind of more players? Is it sort of a well-known, I don't know, well kept secret, poorly kept secret at the high level that like, yeah, this guy is twenty six twenty, but actually he's you know he'll be twenty seven fifty in a year and a half. Is it more common than we think, or is it? Sort uh, of I mean, I think it's sort of um, a post COVID effect. That the fact that we did barely had any chess for for a year meant uh, young players improved at fast pace, uh, like. We can think about one uh, really great example in the US with Hans Niemann, who was barely 2,500, which is not a bad thing, but with no on the verge of 2,700 uh, after one year of playing. And, uh, you know, and of course, part of his improvement was, uh, uh, I mean, major part of his improvement was uh, exactly during that one year time where we, he was playing online. He was probably working his ass off uh, for the major part of the year, not having events. So, and this way, of course, this created a slight deflation because those guys who won the rating points, they took it from somewhere. And then those guys who lose these rating points, they will take it back from somewhere else and so on. So there's this um, sort of deflation happening because, of course, yeah, I'm talking about uh, close to or elite level, but uh, the same thing happened with, uh, and probably even worse with a 2000 year, uh, 2012, 13 year old kids who normally would have uh, been 22, 2300 by that point, but then they were back to 2000 and they took the rating points for the 2300, which then took the points from the 2500 and so on and so on. 
Did this so, happen in Europe too, like in random open tournaments in Europe, or where like a kid would just show up with some stupidly low fee day and just destroy the tournament? It happened here a lot. Kids gained yeah. like, three hundred points and yeah. I, I mean, like uh, I think it will be relatively. Uh, it's it has a relatively small effect, like uh, long term, but for these past two years. And maybe for one or two more years, uh, this uh, you know COVID deflation effects, uh, if I may call it that way, uh, um, will have uh, its say in uh, you know how the players' rating are and uh, how they will evolve. Like, but for instance, it was strange at some point. Like, if you were twenty eight hundred, you barely made it to top five in the world. And now you cleared second, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I don't maybe five or six years ago, right? It was kind of like twenty. Yeah. Years. So there was Magnus, there was Fabi, there was me, there was Wesley, there was uh, Kramnik. Shah at some point, I feel like Shah. Shah at some point, but like the period in time was yeah. So it was twenty seventeen. There was Levon, obviously. Uh, and others, Ikao also made it. Um, but 2017 was crazy. Like, I think by the end of the year, because it, there was a waiting qualification for the candidates, uh, and by the end of the year, so I had the waiting average of 27.95, I think, and I was fourth. Uh, so, of course, Magnus was not in the competition. Then there was Fabi and Wesley, and then there was uh, Kramnik. Uh, and then me. How, how much do you guys even care about that stuff at the top level? For example, going into today, I wanted to say that you are my, you're the highest ranked uh, guest ever of the podcast. That was going to be kind of like funny because Anish, when he joined, was 10th in the world. I thought you were 9th. But actually now from the Olympiad, Anish is 9th by one rating point, like something ridiculous. Like, I mean, basically, yeah. you know, you guys are all super close together. So do you does it even matter at some point if a guy is in a slump and goes to 2760 but has been 2815 or 2810 like do you guys care about that stuff at all or um so it's two things so like i don't really care about that stuff with waiting of course i prefer to win tournaments like that's sure. of course the ultimate goal so there are two reasons why uh like let's say three reasons why to care about waiting. So first, you're number one in the world, you're Magnus Carlsen for 10 years, uh, even more, probably 12 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, yeah, that's a big gap. And the fact that he's been able to maintain that first spot uh, shows his skills basically. And um, the fact that, you know, even though at sometimes we, we catch him up, uh, in general, he's always above or like worst case equal to the pack, but like you can say he's been for 12 years, not some of the best players in the world. And that's crazy, especially in those days. Uh, then there's uh, this rating qualification spots for the candidates. Of course, they are so vital. So when you're close to, to it, you should take proper attention to the rating. And then uh, there's uh, like, when I had this recent slump in form where I was suddenly back to 2750 and, you know, uh, instead of being top five uh, to 10, I was suddenly top 10 to 15. And basically I didn't want, and I still don't want because it's pretty close to go beyond top 10 because that's when things get difficult. And it's funny, it's not about the matter of playing these top level events. Uh, like, it's not for the money, but because it's also the way to keep sharp, the way to keep at the highest level to play the best players. So, I see. So, it's kind of, is it sort of a pipeline? For example, if it's January and you're number 18 in the world, let's say, that just so random person is, I don't know who 18th in the world is right now. But... Yeah, yeah, basically, you don't get invited to the best events. I see. Like maybe maybe one in a year, but but you don't get the best events. That yeah okay. So if you don't play in the if you're not invited to to Tata Steel, I I don't remember the exact calendar off the top of my head. But you're saying it's sort of a a, a snowball effect. Now 
at least you have a chance of being invited to some meltwater event, I guess, if you're if you're outside of there. But that's under, true. Under normal circumstances, uh huh. Yeah. I see. So you have to rely on Bundesliga, I guess. Is that what it is? Like the leagues? If if you don't get invites, or you have to rely on the opens, like uh, what is the? Well, I mean, in terms of making money, to be honest, like of course, I feel very lucky that I can. On, I mean, I can just rely on uh, playing chess to to earn money. But like for me, there would be tons of opportunity to make money in terms of uh, you know even giving lessons or or whatever. So money is not a problem. It's really about uh, being able to keep playing with uh, against uh, the other my colleagues like okay to try to beat them to to play as best as I can and ultimately because my goal is, of course is to be the best uh, like even if the task is tremendous that's uh, that's still what I want to do got it okay yeah makes sense and I'm assuming most of the guys who don't get those invites to those events, they they do play in the leagues. They do make some. Well, now you can make chessable courses as. Of course, years. like uh, you can you can do a lot of things. You can even work on your chess. Like uh, now we we learned with COVID that uh, you know when you don't have events, uh, you know you can just uh, work nonstop and yeah, like you can see the, the amount of improvement these guys uh, have made uh, during COVID. Uh, these young guys, it, it was just crazy to see. Like, I think, yeah. So they were like, so Abdul Satov, we kind of knew him already, like before COVID, but still improved a lot. And we didn't know about Ar Arjun. We didn't know about him. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Um... And yeah, Sintawaf, we didn't know about it. We we learned about him uh, during the World Cup and. Yeah, from what I've seen of him, for instance, uh, like I've seen him in Riga, like not even doing the chess action, but we would uh, like solve puzzles in the evening because we were all uh, in a lockdown, you know, so we were on the 11th floor, not sure it was 11th floor, but I think 11th floor of the hotel, uh, solving puzzles and stuff. And yeah, it was really impressive. So. So yeah, these young guys, uh, of course, they're coming for us. There's Jesse Penko, but we knew about him. Like, I knew about Jesse Penko for like almost 10 years because of uh, because of Kramnik. Yeah, so he was, um, so Vladi we were at an event and told me uh, like, no, I'm uh, in charge of uh, the young talents of Russia. And there's this guy, Jesse Penko, really off him. Wow. Must be great to get a blessing of like one of the one of the goats. I don't know if yeah. Well, <laughs> then you know it's one thing to get his blessing, and it's another thing to, to prove it because I mean uh, yeah. you know places at the top are expensive and you know this uh, like of course it feels strange to include myself in the in the old guys com <laughs> you know uh, among the old guys, but that sort of. Uh, is a case now so yeah and i'm not gonna give up my my spot so easily right makes sense uh, it's true by the way uh the story about arjun yeah the han story is insane uh of course uh, the story about arjun is very funny i i only knew about arjun because he i don't know if he still works with or used to work with uh the grandmaster from israel michalevsky and yeah. there was a funny summer here where i i think i earned my last i am norm I played Victor in a tournament and I was yeah. supposed to play him three days, four days later in a tournament we had already signed up for. So we were going to play two tournaments, yes. one in New York and one in Edmonton. And if you've ever been to Edmonton, Canada, I'm very sorry. But if you've never been there, don't go there. There's nothing there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, I've sadly never been to Canada, but uh, when, because it's probably a matter of when, but when I go to Canada, I will make sure not to have uh, Edmonton on my list, yeah, unless yeah. someone tells me great thing about it. Yeah, no, 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 no. But I, I remember uh, Victor making some tweet or Facebook post like, congratulations to my student who earned three IM norms and three GM norms in like six months, something like, you know. And I, yeah. And even four or five years ago, that was kind of almost felt typical for an Indian teenager, just some random yeah. Indian teenager is going to get all his norms. 
But yeah, it's insane seeing him be 2700 and um, seems like none of those guys have been affected by nerves yet. They just sort of show up. Of course, you know okay, better. Okay, when you're young, you don't get so much affected by nerves. You like you want to prove your worth so at all costs, basically. So, so they're here to you know to replace us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, that's uh, it's your job to kind of delay delay that process and exactly knock, knock them back down i see uh it's i i guess arjun is what 18 or 19 um i would say 2003 but i'm not totally you, sure you're right because his chess.com username was gandivam 2003 so i'm assuming it's yeah 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 so that's that's probably the year he's born um a quick question about canada i'm assuming you would go to montreal uh because obviously I feel like it's, uh, I mean, I think it's the best city in Canada, but I've heard that, um, what is this whole thing? Like, uh, people from France, if they go to Montreal, there's something about the, the French language. It's something, is it the dialect? So, or? No, like, um, okay. So Canadians from Quebec, they speak very good French, but they have this accent, which is, uh, <laughs> Which sounds kind of ridiculous. I, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> from a French perspective, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. And uh, but yeah, even funny at times. So so that's the thing, I guess. But um, I mean, they, they speak very proper French. Is it like Americans and people from the South? Is it like you sound like a Southerner? You say word like what? What is the best thing you can compare it to? If you can compare it to something. <laughs> I don't know about the U.S. because it feels like in the U.S. Uh, like, there's like a different accent for for every for every state, more or less, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess, but yeah, well, New Yorkers have a way of talking. Uh, I think this. I, I'm sure the South has different accents based on state. So no, um, like I would more compare it to. Uh, you know, a United Kingdom because uh, okay. uh, you see what I mean. Like yeah, yeah. the way uh, the guys in London speak is not the same as you know in other cities in England. But then it gets even worse when you talk to Scottish or or to Irish people, and uh, some of these guys, I just don't understand them. Even though I've, like I feel like I speak decent English, but sometimes uh, this accent it just um, it didn't change this radically. Uh, are you here? You the language, but did you uh, do you watch any Netflix? You enjoy any I shows? do, uh, I do. And Peaky Blinders, uh, Peaky Blinders, I've uh, shamefully never really started, but uh, it's probably one of the next shows uh, I'm gonna watch. But uh, lately, I've been taking a break for, from Netflix for some reason. And still no excuse for, like, I've indulged Peaky Blinders for the past uh, five to ten years. Because I, I mean, I even heard about it early, but I never really started for some reason. Me neither. I don't really watch shows at all. I, I, not because I think I'm, like, better than people who watch shows, but of course there are people who watch shows and make their whole personality about the show, and, okay, that's, I, I, I am be yeah, that's I'm better than thing. those people. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I don't know, I, yeah, it was just, it came up on Netflix. I'm only asking, of course, because we're talking about England and all the different accents. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yeah, hi highly, highly recommended. Uh, great show. Very slow, though. Like, each episode is, like, one hour, so if you... Yeah, but I like the slow part. Like, for instance, uh, one of the best shows, I mean, the best show I watched was Breaking Bad. Um, but it has sort of this fast pace uh, at some point. But uh, Better Call Saul, which I enjoy a lot, has this extremely slow pace in basically every episode. But uh, I still enjoy it this way. Okay, if you like it, then yeah. you'll. I mean, there's some episodes where... You know, one big plot moment happens, and for fifty-eight minutes, it's a lot of intense dialogue, and it's. Uh, but it's yeah, it's a it's a great show. Uh, I yeah, but that's probably one of the reasons I haven't started yet because uh, it does take some sort of energy to to watch it and to fully comprehend it. Otherwise, you're just like if you're just watching for ten minutes without really thinking about it, you have to to rewind and so on. 
So that means during tournament, I cannot really watch it because <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't be that kind of experience. Uh, but having said that, how did you, how do you watch Breaking Bad? I, I saw first few episodes of Breaking Bad when I was, I think, a young teenager, like 15, 16. Yes. That show was so depressing. It just depressed me to watch, like every episode in the first two, like maybe two seasons was just, I just felt so overwhelmingly anxious and sad. <laughs> it was just such an intense show. <laughs> you didn't feel that way? You just watched the show. It's like... I must say that first season, like I liked the first season, but uh, yeah, there were some of these elements you're mentioning that could have bothered me. But um, what was great at the time, and I mean, still more or less my case is when I start a show, I do want to finish it. So, uh, and then, so I definitely didn't drop after first season. Like I can drop after third or fourth season if really things and uh, moving the way I want them to. But yeah, from second season on, uh, just a masterpiece in my opinion. Ah, uh, yeah. I think I dropped off somewhere in, uh, in, in the beginning of season two. So that's, that's, that's what I get told. You're not the first person to say like from season two and onward, it's, uh, it's an excellent show. Maybe one day I will go back. I feel like I'm so late. I mean, everyone's seen the show. My wife has seen the show. It's just, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't isolate myself and watch it. Um, on a uh, more positive note, uh, I we talked a, f a little bit about some of the prodigies in different in different places like U.S., India. Uh, how how big is chess in France? I mean, right now is it? And specifically, I mean, like, how much of a national icon are you? I mean, like, recognizable on the street? You know, just yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've done some TV. Uh, so let's say chess has been gaining lots of momentum in France uh, for two factors, of course, uh, the lockdown and Blitzstream, you know, so rivalry is on, but uh, uh, yeah, Blitzstream has been doing a tremendous job uh, in terms of, you know, attracting a new audience. Like I think during the second part of candidates, there were like 30 to 35 thousand people watching him and following me basically uh in the candidates and uh, as you can guess it's huge so uh like in the streets i do get recognized basically uh, like okay, not every two minutes fortunately <laughs> but uh yeah like one time i, I was sitting at a table uh, in a restaurant outside and yeah in 30 minutes i got recognized by four different persons so all right yeah nice. it's still <laughs> quite impressive quite a change but all this interaction has been only you know fun and good like so because like that's what you're scared of once you get recognized on the street that yeah, sure. people will start uh you know uh being annoying about it but uh when it's not the case when they don't step your boundaries and it's all good i i think you also have the advantage of sort of being in like an athlete and you don't i mean you're not you're not walking around the streets saying things about whatever i mean lockdown vaccination the political stuff you just you yes. just go play chess and you yeah yeah, yeah. and i like uh, compared to for instance actors or whatever we we don't get these paparazzis. So I can go on with my life uh, without being scared of uh, being front page, yeah? I, I noticed you said, you're not the first person to say this. I think India had the same thing. There was, uh, you said there was uh, lockdown was huge for chess, but you didn't mention Queen's Gambit. I imagine- I, Oh, yeah, oh, oh, okay. obviously. Yeah, yeah, oh, obviously. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I, actually I was told by Samay that in India, Queen's Gambit did not have that big of an effect. It was the lockdown and so he was the blitzstream of india i mean he basically yeah. like just invited did you ever go on his stream i feel like you must have at some point uh i, I don't think so actually strangely enough like okay i'll text uh, him and i'll yell we, at are, we had some interactions uh i don't think i made it to his stream okay well i'm going to oh maybe a joint stream but uh whatever I, at least i i don't remember that so which, uh, of course, is a shame because he's been doing a great job. Like I've been following, uh, especially during lockdown, because there was nothing else to do. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, queens gambit had a huge effect, of course. Um, and I could see that, for instance, in Bitstream's numbers, like in terms of audience, uh, it was huge of new persons. Uh, I don't know how many of these persons who started uh, chess with Queen's Gambit uh, remain, but of course it had such a positive effect. I mean, like we've said this over and over, but in terms of uh, reflecting uh, the intensity of chess in tournaments, the intensity of, uh, you know, what we're doing and which, you know, uh, people outside the chess world could not co comprehend, they they got a glimpse into the chess world and why it's so uh, thrilling and uh, exciting. I feel like France, like the, the French chess fans and Blitzstream in particular have done the best job of captivating the audience in that particular language. So for example, I have, I, I mean, for all this stuff about, you know, whatever, like rivalry and I, I I have absolutely zero beef on my end, um, but sometimes like, like I, I think it's good that there's a little bit of trolling and yeah, you know, like, I, like I'm, of course, uh, like if I can intervene on this, I think it shouldn't get personal basically. But other than that, yeah, I, I think it can all be good fun and like, but of course. You know, I'm not Bleach Stream and I'm not you, so I cannot. Yeah, I don't spend, you know, I've told, I've said this many times because sometimes I, I will have, um, I was just going to say I have French fans come in and they're like, uh, they're like, ah, actually you and Bleach Stream are the only guys I watch. Uh, and that's, you know, that's super cool. There's obviously, I don't speak French. So there's a giant community of people who do speak French and that's kind of the destination. And when they get access to you, to... I see he like frequently will have uh, some kind of format where he will commentate on games that some of the top French GMs are playing in Title Tuesday or even vice versa. Like he plays Title yes. Tuesday and then they commentate. Like that's, you know, that's super interesting. So I feel like he's done the best job of that because theoretically that should work in any country, right? Like if a Spanish streamer was huge into chess and yeah. as charismatic why wouldn't the Spanish speaking audience watch? Right. But I, I don't, I don't know of any, I mean, do you know, of any? I know the Portuguese audience, but yeah. th those guys are not like top 10. So they can't follow the candidates. They can't follow. Um, yeah. But okay. It helps of course that, okay. Kevin is so charismatic, like you said, and also, uh, we were on good terms, uh, from the start with Kevin. So, uh, I mean, Sebastian, Etienne, me, uh, Fabien, so, and Vlad, Kachev. So everyone had something to bring to the table. And for instance, I mean, so, and for Kevin, for the audience, it's of course great. Like during candidates, I had uh, me and this is, I had Ali Reza to follow. So, you know, so then you have someone to root for you have, because watching candidates like, uh, from a streamer point of view, I mean, it's six hours game. So if yeah. you have nothing to, if you have no story to tell, then it's, uh, even for the best of streamers, it's impossible to, to comment on. So like every top tournament is following because, uh, uh, because I'm there or you is there. So again, like, uh, so there's a storyline basically from the start, uh, I'll join the stream relatively regularly. Uh, Etienne is uh, more or less all, all the time. Uh, same with uh, all the other guys. Mathieu Cornet, who well, I've not mentioned, but he is also even part of the French team right now in Chennai. So there's always something happening. And of course, credits to Kevin because he's finding always new things to do also to, to keep on entertaining, to keep on educating also the audience. Like it's not only about uh, the entertainment, although of course that's... Uh, absolutely essential, but it's also um, like teaching how it is in the chess and again, like making the development also from the glimpse that you get from Queen's Gambit and then you get even more immersed in the chess world and uh, my best guess is that it's part of the reason why the, the guys in, from France uh, are so hooked on uh, watching Kevin. Who's more famous, you or him? Like, let's say you both sample the same walk for one hour. 
<laughs> I think uh, it's going to be like the same, basically. But you guys are top two. Um, I guess so, yeah. I was just, I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. Now, now Ali Reza will, will Ali Reza is very recognizable. Let's put it this way, right? I mean, how, uh, how tall is Ali Reza actually? Is, uh, I wouldn't like dare to, uh, to say I know it exactly, but at least like 185, which must be six foot two or something. Oh, he always wearing some basketball or like some, yeah, the, the, the shirt, the shirt, the shirts with the teams or he's. He's looking like a like a fa like a fashion guy. I mean, every time I was joking when all of the players were walking in on the candidates, like uh, everybody's dressed, you know. Some he's wearing uh, I forgot what it was, some bra branded stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, that's no, it's 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 cool to see. I mean, U.S. We don't really have a big national identity here. We're too big. We have too many people coming from first, second generation. We don't. I mean, English is uh, that, English, but... That's partly true, but at the same time, there's a big identity in the US, like for every sporting event. Like, yeah. there's a big sporting culture, and, you know, uh, when people uh, in the US are watching, uh, you know, Olympics or whichever sure. event, they, they have a strong sense of identity, which, like, we French, I mean, we do have, but for instance... Uh, in, if I'm watching the Olympics, uh, like when Usain Bolt was uh, was the god of uh, athletism, athletics, mm -hmm. okay, I wouldn't care about how the French guy is doing. Like, I would be happy for him if he does well. But for me, it was like, okay, Bolt has to win. So, like, there's not that. Uh, well, but of course, we didn't have a French guy who could um, be on the same level as Bolt, like we had Le Maître who was the first guy, to, I mean, uh, from uh, Europe to go under 10 seconds, but that meant he could, like, be in the finals and, you know, be there and say hi to the camera, <laughs> which is absolutely a huge level, yeah, yeah. but... I was actually going to ask about that. Uh, okay, biggest sport over there is football, probably, right? Football, for sure, yeah. Uh, I don't... I, I mean, I... I, all I know about the French football league and teams is back in the day when I played FIFA. Uh, I know, yeah. I know of a few. Who's who's the best team in? Uh, it's Paris right now. PSG. Oh, yeah. Sorry, uh, I meant besides Paris. Ah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, okay. Like uh, last year, Marseille finished second, uh, and there's been some changes uh, in terms of French football these past few years, but. Let's say those three most consistent teams, apart from Paris, are uh, Lyon, which uh, I'm the team I'm supporting, Marseille, and Monaco. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I I did not remember about Monaco, but I was gonna. Those are the only but, two teams I remember: uh, Marseille and some, Lyon. <laughs> like at some point ten years ago, Monaco was not that relevant. They were in, even in uh, second league for for a while. Is it strange to have like one monster team in the league, or is it good because they get to participate in like uh, Champions League? And I mean, it's sorry. Is it good or bad to have uh, one football league in in the country, but just one killer team and nobody can ever beat them? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I don't like that uh, so much, but uh, it is what it is, um, and now it's up to. To my team and you know to the other teams to to step up and be able to uh to fight uh with paris and there's been some uh some years where paris didn't want the league uh like even if it's a, a vague minority of them like uh it's a bit like uh bayern dominating bundesliga but again like uh, i feel like it's not like uh, in the ends of Paris to step down, but it's a matter of first stepping up. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, in terms of European football, I mean, I wish we were more consistent from for the start and, you know, uh, win some titles there because, yeah, it feels like we, we should win more than uh, we actually do. And yeah, that's probably also 
partly, I think, due to the lack of uh, sports culture in France, uh, I would say. Like, and not saying that we cannot achieve rich things, like we won the World Cup in every uh, team sports we, we're dominant, but uh, like even basketball, like we we finished second in the Olympics. So that's actually like being first, <laughs> considering Did, US team. Didn't you guys get Embiid? Isn't Embiid we, now French? We, Embiid is French. He's not playing this year because uh, he had this injury, but right. uh, he, he will almost for sure play next year, yeah. And don't you also have this other guy now? Gobert, I mean, we have Gobert, we have... Uh, Ah, it's a young guy, yeah? You mean the, the yeah. guy who is uh, supposed to be first in the draft uh, next year? Wenbayana, something like when that? Wenbayama, Wenbayama, yeah. I think. Yeah, 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 he's crazy good, but also point to injury point, so... Yeah, because he's huge. He's so, huge, I mean... yeah. <laughs> like, he's projected to be first pick for, like, two years now. Yeah, but that's always, I mean, the taller... That doesn't that... mean, like, that's yeah. only the first step, but, of course... Uh, there's huge potential in the in the French team. Um, a huge three, not a big three, a huge three. Yeah, but I meant uh, there's not enough recognition of sportsmen in the French culture. Like I can see it with tennis. There's always some people who will be like, "Oh, but these guys uh, they haven't won a Grand Slam for 35 years and so on." But like, not everything has been done especially if I compare to, to the US in terms of, you know, providing, uh, you know, the, the kids with like the best environment to train. And like in the US, it's absolutely huge part of your dominance, like in terms of college uh, sports or even high school sports, there's leagues, there's uh, special training, there's special uh, everything like for, for the guys to succeed. And of course you see the results at the end of the day in the Olympics, for instance. Got you. Makes sense. Uh, it's true, actually. As I was thinking to talk more about some French sports stuff, I realized that with the exception of, for example, PSG, I, I don't know a whole lot, but... Uh, yeah, no. I'm... So, like, again, one great exception to that fact is team sports, like in volleyball, mm -hmm. in handball, in basketball, in f football, like... I mean, not American football, obviously, but uh, yeah, we have this great cohesion in general. And, uh, you know, I would say we generally overperform, but it's also because we have great players. Like, uh, yeah, in basketball, we have a crazy team when you think about it. Because uh, before TP made it to, to the NBA, no other Frenchman had made it to the NBA. And that was like 20 years ago. Oh, wow. I didn't. I didn't realize that. I think I knew that somewhere deep down, but oh wow, yeah. That, yeah, that must have been a huge deal. Yeah. And then there was Gio, there was Batum, uh, yeah. I mean, Batum, that's, uh, and now the team, yeah, it's just crazy. You have Fournier, who like, is a starter basically for most NBA teams. Uh, he's a starter yeah. for, I think, he, I think he's currently on the Knicks. Uh, he is on the Knicks, yeah. I'm really, uh, I'm really, I mean, I'm but really he was sorry. not. <laughs> he was not a uh, completely a starter, but uh, this year. But and like when he was in the Celtics, he was struggling a bit. Before that, he was in Magic. It's Magic, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but of course, uh, Gobert is huge, well, and Kitilina was been struggling for a while. Um, but now he seems to be enjoying things better in, in the Mavericks. And he's been playing great for France. So, you know, like in terms of uh, the French team, uh, things have been going really, really great. Like the team was uh, two years ago, and this was without Embiid, of course, and without Kumbayama, where we will see uh, how, how this develops. Uh, we, uh, we've got, I mean, I don't want to take the full two hours that you said you had. So probably in the next like 20-ish minutes, I had a... I was looking over here. I asked my, my community if they had any, any questions that they wanted to ask you. And obviously, I had a few that I just kind of wanted to rapid yeah. fire um, that I was curious about. I'm sure that the people would be curious about. You've answered a few of these, uh, as, as I'm sure you took a look at the list. But OK, so the first one, of course, being 
what is the story of you being known as kind of the two opening guy, right? Like Grunfeld, Nydorf, um, and like a few questions to sort of add on to that. Uh, is Kasparov, for example, like your favorite player? Because obviously that was a huge part of his repertoire. Uh, and is it, is it like, difficult, I mean, at the highest level uh, to, to have a repertoire like that or, or no? I mean, do you yeah. enjoy it? Uh, so the so Fisher at the time was my favorite player. Like, and of course, it only makes sense to have a favorite player when you're a child. Like, uh, mm-hmm. up until I was fifteen or something, then uh, it doesn't really matter. Like to me, I've uh, of course enjoyed watching the games of uh, all time greats, but uh, and Kasparov is arguably like with uh, Magnus uh, best players in, in history. So, yeah, of course, I've studied these games, uh, especially for Nagidorf purposes. Um, yeah, I learned Grenfeld um, back in 2002, 2003 with my, with my coach uh, back then, who was Nicolas Pirdonov, who had a huge influence uh, on French chess. You know, uh, he came from Bulgaria, I think back in 1985 or 1990, I'm not sure. And he had influence over lots of players, uh, young players from France and uh, myself definitely included. Also, I can mention uh, Sébastien Mazé, Jules Moussa, and in some way, Etienne Bacro as well. So like uh, kind of the French team, I would say. <laughs> um, so that was a grand fed, and Nidorf was a similar story. I learned it uh, again, like a bit later. Uh, with Arnaud Rochard, who was uh, coaching at the time. And yeah, I guess I just enjoyed these positions. Like, uh, because when I was a kid, I was reluctant with theory, really reluctant. And I was like playing uh, sub lines uh, everywhere. Uh, trying to avoid theory at all costs. You cannot do that nowadays because every subline has loads of theory, but back then you could do that. So then I finally took this step of, you know, uh, playing main lines. And of course I enjoyed the position. And like, for instance, with Night Off, I can say I've enjoyed so much the variety of things. Like, I feel like you cannot play Berlin, for instance, uh, or Petro forever, but uh, night off it's been 15 years and yeah you have uh, so many different positions coming out of it that uh, it feels good that doesn't mean that i'm only a two two openings guy like even if that's maybe the case uh, i've played the slav over the years i've played the kawakan i've played even occasionally the french defense uh some other some other sicilians uh, i've played queen's gambit accepted so you know I, I've done different things, but of course, I always have these two openings as my main. Uh, it is a, a solo, of course, like in terms of uh, lines you have to remember and, you know, the amount uh, has uh, decoupled at least in the last uh, few years, but uh, it is what it is. And I do have this advantage of being very knowledgeable of uh, what's going to happen after that. And uh, yes, there's been more than a few games where I was in trouble after the opening, uh, but then would navigate just better, especially in the night off. When it comes to uh, like the difference in the two, uh, I think it's, w- would you agree it's easier to uh, it's easier to, to, like, if you had to keep one and throw away the other, it's much easier to keep the Sicilian because you can play Sveshnikov, you can play, you know, you can go into Rouser, you can, like, whatever. I, it feels as though the Sicilian has a tremendous amount of flexibility remaining even after the initial setup versus, uh, versus the Grunfeld. Like, once you're in the Grunfeld, it, it almost feels like White can deviate on move, whatever. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and you sort of have to be prepared everywhere. Uh, or do you disagree? I mean, do you think like you would keep the moon uh, filled? It basically depends on the meta. So, like at some point, uh, two or three years ago, I was really struggling with the Grandfeld, 
uh, because everywhere there would be exactly these situations where uh, you have to remember long false lines to, and you have no choice because if you deviate, you get lost. But then, um, because you evolve, you find these new ideas which make your life easier here and there. And then this amount of work you have to do is uh, is less. So right now, uh, Grenfell is actually in top shape, but uh, like still, of course, uh, having other openings to play is a good thing uh, at the same time. And as for Nidoff, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think I can improvise playing uh, the Sveshnikov uh, overnight, even though I've played it again uh, a couple of times, but um, yeah, Night Off is different because there's like, uh, I mean, like you have to be prepared for 21 different moves on move six. Is it really 21 now? Wow. Uh, there's <laughs> like, from what I remember, there's six bishop moves, like basically all the bishop moves that don't drop a piece. There's uh, three queen moves. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pawn moves, which means every pawn moves except for b4 and e5. But g4 is okay, sort of relevant, h4 is definitely relevant. Uh, there's rook g1, and there's knight b3. And that should be it, but... A friend of mine has a repertoire of rook g1 and h4, uh, and in the last tournament that he played, uh, he he was in a GM norm round robin. He actually got at some point in the opening plus one, I think, or even plus two positions in all four games playing H four rook G one. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think he won a single game. <laughs> like I think I love him, but like the games were just so nuts. He just had moments yeah, yeah. where, and frequently he would come back and message our our, our chat and say, "I had no clue I was winning." It just it's totally no, different playing the game. Um, like yeah, is that summarize the state of chess, how it evolved in the last 15 years. But when I learned the game, I mean, it's a night off. Uh, I mean, bishop d3, we would laugh at this move because you just played g6, bishop g7, what's the bishop doing on d3? Right. Now it's one of the main lines. Uh, h3 was not really relevant, although I already felt his potential. I started playing it as white uh, for a little bit. Now it's arguably uh, one of the main lines. Uh, Bishop G5 was the uh, absolute main line that hasn't changed really like uh, um, and H4, I mean, nobody would consider H4, Rook G1 as well. Uh, also some players were probably playing it already, Rook G1, probably not H4. But the weirdest thing is Knight B3, I think. Like yeah. this is the weirdest because you're just retreating your Knight. Feels like a loss of tempi, but for some reasons, it makes some sense. Sure. Yeah. I there was a period in my life I wanted to learn open Sicilian and I remember studying some books came out. This was like way before the times of, of Chessable. Now anybody with access to Leela can come up with some amazing uh, prep. Yeah, and no, the thing is uh, I mean it's not only Leela, it's stockfish now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But now, like compared to even five years ago, everybody has access to um, to a decent engine because even from the worst laptops, you have uh, access to to engines, and normally you have better than a uh, worst laptop. Like I see these guys, they're two thousand, twenty one hundred, and they are so well prepared compared to what was uh, state of chess like ten years ago. Yeah. It's true. Uh, I wanted to ask you also about, uh, of course, candidates. So what was that like? <laughs> I mean, you, you've been to one or two. Was that your one and only? One only, but uh, that's actually quite shameful on my part, considering I've been. Uh, it felt like I was uh, overperforming in the years where the candidates would happen. Mm -hmm. But then the year of qualifications, uh, I wouldn't overperform. Also, that's not totally the case. Like there was one year in 2017, especially where like 2017 and 2019, even though I ultimately played the candidates 
in 2020, but I was just so close of qualifying that I, in every respect, uh, reaching semifinals of World Cup, like losing in the Armageddon against Levon in 2017, uh, finishing third in the Grand Prix, uh, at least in 2019 and so on. So, um, yeah, that took a toll on me, of course, but um, yeah, ultimately I did play those candidates in 2020. Um, of course, the experience was, I mean, ridiculous, simply like to, uh, like it was exceptional circumstances, but to have the tournament split into two parts was uh, very strange to, uh, to wait one year for the resumption where, you know, it can, resumption can happen any moment. So you have to be like, uh, always like, um, uh, in the starting blocks, like you have to keep your foot in the starting blocks, but for like one year straight, which is a totally strange experience. And, and you know, you have to hide opening prep at the same time, you still have to keep playing events to, to keep in shape. You have to keep on, you know, having these training sessions. So it was really weird, but, um, in general, I can just say that uh, Nepo played so much better overall, so much more consistent. Uh, this time too. Yeah, this time too. So like, yeah, it was not an accident. Of course, I let's just say that I managed to keep some suspense when I won against him before we went did the first half because otherwise he would have been winning with it as well. Yeah, obviously you can't change the past. Uh, it, it, everybody, everybody always has a, a theory that uh, if Jan suffers a roadblock in the middle of a tournament, and, and they, they they say that that break helped him more than I guess it helped anybody else. That's just a theory. I, I don't. There's, there's no I mean, point objectively, it. it's probably the case, but uh, I have this theory that uh, as a, I mean, not only a chess player, but as a sportsman, you have to adapt. And this is arguably one of my strengths. So that you know, you adapt to any playing conditions, you adapt to whatever you know the circumstances are, and you're just here to play chess to the best of your abilities. So there was this interruption. I think it was justified in the sense that you know uh, the borders were closing down, and you know you cannot make a decision like. From that, at that moment, I don't think FIDE could make another decision but to have the tournament to have the players come back to, to their countries. And yeah, of course, Jan profited like because he won at the end. Like you could say, like, had I had won at the end, we could have said I, I would have profited that Fabi won at the end because he bet me in the first game uh, at the resumption. If he had kept on this trick and one in the end, we would have said he had profited, but uh, what does it matter? Like, uh, these are circumstances that you have to deal with, you have to play your best after that, and that's it. Some players have said that the candidates is a, is a pressure experience unlike, unlike any other, and so the level is actually significantly lower. I, I kept seeing this, this candidates, I mean, Kramnik was saying some guys were playing like 2300s, that was uh, was, uh well but... I, I mean no like <laughs> i i actually like Vladi, but uh, his candidates last candidate's performance in 2018 was uh sloppy so well i mean i, I the que the question i wanted to ask was kind of like did you feel the same way because of it's the candidates or did you not feel the same way because you were kind of a last minute were you sort of like i have a golden ticket to Play and enjoy this event. You you were doing yeah. Quite well, so. No, of course I had the golden ticket. So, like at the same time, I had lots of uh, work to to make up for it. And uh, yeah, I was pretty lucky in that sense that it didn't show so much because, uh, especially with White, where I was on the wall, because uh, like then we had almost one year to train and we could see okay, there's a hole here and there and. You know, I was just lucky they, they were poking the wrong holes, I guess. Um, so, so yeah, um, I had the golden ticket. I 
and of course i really wanted to make the candidates uh, for a long time and uh, uh, objectively i think i should have played it uh, before that but let's say by the time uh, i made it for the first time i was thrilled to have this chance and uh, i wanted to do my best to win uh, I don't know if you've been asked this question, but I have to ask it. So, Magnus won't defend this classical title. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, any thoughts uh, on that? I mean, what does it mean? It's Obviously, it's uh, whoever wins the world championship. Like, I've seen this already. It's going to have a little kind of star attached to it. And, I mean, it, it seems like at the top level, people are like, they get the decision. So... I'm sure there's stuff the general public doesn't know that goes, you know, more into just every, everything. No, like, like... I, I think, um, like, for Magnus, he's been 10 years uh, being the world champion. And the world championship match is just something different. Like, you train for six months for it. And it does take a significant amount of time. It does take up some energy and... I guess at the end of the day, Magnus decided he wanted to keep his energy and his time for for the things. Uh, so it doesn't mean that he's not going to be competitive in every tournament he plays from now on. I mean, he won the last one he played in. He's playing the Singfield Cup uh, next month. So, you know, in terms of... And he's playing the Olympiad right now, but uh, team events, I mean, like, we could see that Norway is definitely not on the level of other teams uh, because, well, one great board doesn't make up for, for the rest of the team. I mean, so they've improved so much in a way, but still lots of going to make up for. Um, so yeah, I totally get it. Uh, I don't think though that there should be a, like uh, a story attached to the next world champion. I mean, the next world champion might not be the best player in the world, but uh, like it's the one who showed up. Like in every other sport, you're not gonna say uh, the, the country who won the World Cup uh, is not the best country in the world uh, because of uh, blah blah. Someone was injured, or you know, it doesn't work that way. So whoever played is a world champion, and I think we love the worst world champion. Uh, whether it's Yan or whether it's Ding Liuan. Uh, but then comes the question of the format of the match, which yeah. uh, which is another thing. Like here, and it's only my personal opinion because really, like I've talked to many people, and some uh, like it's a traditional way. Some really want you know to keep this history of a champion being. Uh, um decided in matches but uh i don't know for me like there could be an argument for changing uh completely the format uh like for instance when it was uh, for a while the knockouts i'm not really a fan of this i think it's uh uh too specific an event the knockouts uh also, I don't think like now we can see every winner of the World Cup uh, is uh, is really like top uh, ten or fifteen in the world. Basically, like we've had Kramnik, we've had Levan, we've had uh, Rajabov, we've had um, twenty fifteen. I don't remember. Um, ah, yeah, kayaking. Mm. Uh, so. But the thing is, of course, the winners don't repeat. Like 2009 was Boris, 2011 it was, I think, Peter. Uh, so, yeah, we don't have repeat winners, which means that it's maybe a bit too much. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, the difference here between uh, chess and tennis is that uh, the draw makes it, uh, the existence of draws make it tougher for the for the better guys to to win because okay in grand slam you have it's over five sets so of course you will have like uh federal nadal Djokovic. at the end of the day you have to beat at least two of them to win and right. yeah this is the story of they both got to 20 plus grand slams 
uh, yeah, which yeah, is a true. unique fit in history, I guess. So yeah, knockouts for world championship, I'm not sure. Uh, but you could decide it by a cycle of these events. This could be a, an idea, like to have uh, four tournaments that we call Grand Slams, which can be knockouts then, because of course, with four of them. But that would mean changing completely the format of the chess world. You can keep the match then. So you can add days of rapid, days of blitz, like Magnus was suggesting. I'm not totally sure, but I'm still open to the idea. I think one requirement would be to have sets. I think this was a really great idea by Fide uh, when I heard of it, uh, because it means no game with zero stakes and also ability to take more risk at the start, because if you lose a game, I mean, it probably means you lose the set, but then you will have opportunity to win the, the next set and, uh, and make a comeback. So, because often like, when you lose the first game in a match, it doesn't mean you lose the match. Uh, but uh, you can see uh, players sometimes taking a more prudent approach because uh, cautious, being more cautious because uh, uh, because they have to. Because I mean, you don't come back. You just don't come back from a two games deficit, for instance. Yeah, that's true. I I would be. I mean, it sounds great to have. Uh, the concept of a of a tour and then grand you know grand slam some big events i mean the online events are kind of trying to do that where they have uh, majors and then they had the other kind of style of events uh that was a lot of fun but admittedly uh the last few i especially if like magnus hikaru i mean you i mean if if there's no if there's some 2700s but not really the rest i mean the truth is just people aren't as interested uh, unless it's 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 all the big guys like everybody. Yeah, yeah. We say we don't necessarily enjoy seeing all the same people, but we also really don't enjoy not seeing. Yeah, and it's crazy because, like, for instance, the last candidate it was obvious. You see, so many of the great players who just didn't make it. So there was Aronian, there was uh, Wesley, there was Charles, there was me. Uh, I mean, that's four Anish. players. Anish, Anish. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I was not trying to forget. I know, I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's just so many top players right now that, uh, you know, when you have eight spots, uh, it just means that some big guys will miss. Um, actually, I'm, as, as far as I know, Magnus doesn't have a ticket into the candidates, right? He still has to qualify for the next candidates? Like, I... uh, yeah, because he's not uh, the last uh, loser of the world championship now. So interesting. That's funny. So he, yeah, he has to. Um... Yeah, it's, I mean, arguably, like at the very least, I think he will play the World Cup because he likes this event for like for good reasons. I've mentioned that. Is there still rating spot? Too. Like, does is there one rating spot? I thought they removed the rating spot and now they gave it to Grand Swiss. Uh, that was. Uh, case wait last year no last year they gave it to uh, it was complicated so they gave the spot to Teimo because he didn't play uh yeah because of covid so that was arguably the wild cards uh i think they've removed the wild card for the next years but i'm not completely sure oh okay yeah like uh i don't have knowledge like i don't think they've uh, published uh, exactly what's going on because I think no Grand Chess Tour is in negotiations to have some oh. some spots, yeah. Because yeah, uh, so it was two spots from FIDE Grand Prix, uh, two spots from the World Cup, obviously. Uh, turned out to be one spot from World Cup and one spot by rating because kayaking got uh, expelled. Uh, for non-chess reasons, like, okay. Uh, like, objectively, I think he did go over the top, but uh, that's not the, the matter. Uh, so Dink ended up playing. Um, so one spot for Nepo, who was the last uh, challenger, and two more spots. I don't even remember. 
Uh, it's he, from the Grand Suites, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kikaro and uh, report uh, from uh, from Grand Prix. From Grand Prix, yeah. Yeah, we we never know. <laughs> we, we 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 never know. Although it was obviously, uh, it was fun to follow the candidates for about eighty percent of it because you already knew Nepo was going to win. But there was this question of the last day. Obviously, the Hikaru Ding game. Actually, I was completely convinced was meaningless. Uh, but. Uh, um... I mean, for a while, I was sure it was meaningless. I mean, it's, but uh, I mean, no, I was not sure it was meaningless because I had insights, of course, and for instance, uh, like yeah, I have good uh, knowledge of uh, like Magnus thinking. I'm not sure, but uh, I know very well Laurent Fresnel, who is one of his main seconds, yeah. and we talk about things. And basically, what uh, like there have been history of uh, previous champions, you know, liking to uh, to play these mind games with in of press conferences, and you know, thinking things, uh, saying things they they don't even remotely think. But with Magnus, it's not the case. He just speaks his mind openly. So there was always a chance that he was not going to play the second he said it. Yeah, that's sort of what I've heard after. It's like, he's been telling you from the beginning what he was going to do, and <laughs> nobody was listening. So, okay, yeah, I, I, I guess so. Uh, I, I Ultimately, guess I thought he would play. And of course, like, but what made it unclear, like, to me, what made it, I mean, I could even say relatively unpleasant was like, ah, we'll only play if it's Alueza or whatever, like, Okay, yeah, there's no reason to to say these things. Like this is the only thing. I, but I mean, again, he was probably thinking it. Like it was probably his uh, his reflection. Like I know Ikawa said, if he had finished second, uh, Magnus would have played to avoid Ikawa being uh, a challenger, Potential, potentially, potentially world champion, or yeah. yeah. I mean, from my point of view. And of course, I'm not Magnus, so I cannot say this with 100% certainty, but I'm 95% sure Magnus wouldn't have played anyway. Okay, but 5%, maybe. <laughs> uh, 5%. Okay, that's... Uh, I know, I know, yeah. I know. I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, fa the fans, uh, yeah, when Hikaru said that, that was, that was one of the kind of joke joking theories. There was a, uh, Anna Kramling was streaming in the park in Spain, and even a niche way before the tournament was over, like five, six rounds before the tournament yeah. was over. He said the same thing. He's like, ah, if Kikaru gets second, I think Magnus will defend. So, um, No, no, like there's obviously some uh, reasonable basis for, sure. for this interpretation, but I really don't think it's the case. It seems a bit, yeah. I mean, it's not, you're not even, you're trying to control someone else's life by also, and then also yeah. doing, doing something you don't actually want to do. It just seems... But yeah. it's it's always good to have um, some theories. Uh, we we can rapid fire a few questions. I know I know we've uh, we've we've been here for a while. So um, you're one of the I don't I don't know how many people in the top fifteen top twenty went to college, but you got a math degree. Uh, my my yeah. my wife actually also has a math degree. So what's the story there? Like, were you not sure you were going to be a professional player, or uh, no? I was pretty sure. Like I was at least pretty sure I would try my luck. I was already top 100 in the world. Uh, so I definitely was going to try my luck. But um, so at the time, you didn't need that much uh, opening works. Let's say like you didn't wait to nonstop play or work on chess uh, to you know keep on improving. And I guess this made it for a slower pace of improvement. But at the same time, at the end, I made it to the top, and uh, you know, there's still a few more things I want to accomplish again. But uh, let's say it might have delayed my journey, but I'm not even convinced because I'm also a guy who functions like I don't want to be uh, like fed with chess like every single minute of my life. I need some breaks, I need, and yeah, for a while I was like. Like, okay, high school was pretty nice and I want to experience university. I want to meet other people uh, apart from the chess world. I, I love the chess world, but 
it's different uh, center of interest, it's different conversations. And I wanted to keep, you know, hanging out with people my age, uh, more or less. And I knew I could do it, like I knew that immediately if things became too tough, that if university was going to take too much time out of my life and out of my chest, uh, then I would drop it immediately. And uh, like I anyway didn't have a plan to pursue like after my first degree because I thought it's a good basis to stop on and then I can go to the chess world. And if ultimately I don't like, I can easily go back and uh, get a master's degree or whatever I would do afterwards. But uh, well, ultimately that didn't happen to be the case. So that's good. Uh, and anyway, it would have been uh, definitely too tough uh, to continue uh, pursuing both. Like a master's degree would have been over the top. Like I was cruising uh, for the first two years, third year, like I didn't have any issue, um, you know, to earn my degree, but I had issues to actually comprehend what I was studying, which is a different story. You got a math uh, degree, right? So it's probably very, I mean, I, I don't even know what's the highest level of math. It's no, nice. like, I mean, for me, it feels like I know the basics, maybe a little more than the basics, but I don't feel particularly good in mathematics, like compared to, you know, to real mathematicians. But uh, I certainly enjoy mathematics as a hobby and yeah, we'll probably come back to it uh, uh, someday after my career is over. Yeah, the, you guys always get asked these questions. I'm not asking you this specific question. I've, I've seen many guys get asked, uh, if not just what would you be doing? I kind of hate that question. Uh, but like, you know, you have, the, you have the math degree. So, I mean, and you earlier in our chat, you said, you know, two, four more years uh, of this. So... Once chess is over, have you started thinking? I mean, are you going to be playing poker? You're going to be playing, you know, you're going to be still in chess, but teaching ambassador of something. I mean, what what are we going to see you do? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, plenty of these options are on the table. Uh, I mean, I've played poker uh, sometimes, and I don't feel like I, I could make it uh, as a poker player because uh, chess is one of the few few disciplines where I have uh, any sense of patience, let's say. Sure. So, and it feels like in poker, I mean, of course, knowing your math, it, it's good, but patience is one of the main factor and the ability to, to not tilt also. So let's say poker is out of uh, the question as at least as a professional poker player um, for now. So, but there are many things I could pursue. Like, of course, I could still be in the chess world. Maybe, maybe teach uh, the young uh, the youngsters from France. Like, I mean, I will definitely have uh, value to provide them. Like, uh, after my career is over, to you know, tell them what it is in the, at the top and how to to take the necessary steps. So that's one option that I'll definitely be considering. Uh, other options are like, first of all, taking um, one year break. I think that will be fully deserved uh, uh, by the time I stop uh, playing competitively. I, I mean, yeah, I just don't think I will fully abandon chess. Like I, I have this feeling that for instance, this World Rapid and Blitz Championship, I will basically be playing some uh, for life. I mean, not really for life, because at some point I might not be good enough to even play them like in, let's say, 30 or 40 years. But um, but yeah, I do feel like part of me will always be connected to chess. Because again, like the fact, like I said, I don't want to be fed with chess every day, uh, every minute, let's say. Uh, but at the same time, I love chess. I've loved chess for 25 years. So it is uh, not only part of my life, but it's my whole life. Would you chess box? Um, so, yeah, I mean, 
right now, no, but um, I've been told uh, repeatedly by my fitness coach that at some point I should start learning uh, boxing, but as a, you know, cardio kind of thing, like to improve my physical shape. And yeah, I've never really found the time, but at some point I do plan on finding the time to uh, to do to do some boxing. And yeah, so that means that at some point uh, I would probably be able to chess box, but um, so that's only hypothetical for now, but let's say yes. Yeah, I would not dare give you any sort of advice, chess life or otherwise, but uh, I... I've been going, I thought I was going to be part of some chess boxing event. Uh, it was like in some potential conversation. So I went to try it. And if you ever thought any sport was difficult, this sport is, I mean, just one minute of throwing this, you know, one pound, like 16 ounce gloves. It's just, oh my God, uh, you feel your yeah. It's crazy. So it feels like it, yeah. It's, uh, I have, I have a new, I just thought it was some guys throwing punches, but I mean, your whole body gets into it. It's, uh, no, but like, yeah, I know some things because yeah. So at the um, place where I go to train, so there are some guys who are doing uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, any sort of box like Muay Thai, uh, yeah. regular boxing games. Yeah. It just, it's just pretty crazy. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I, I don't, we, we obviously, I mean, viewers submitted all sorts of goofy questions, uh, but uh, I, I also want to be respectful of your time. I, I think, uh, I think this was good. I think we covered a lot uh, and um, Great. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you once again for joining. Uh, it's a, it's an honor to have you. You are, you, you, like I said, you are the highest ranked player who has ever been on this podcast. Uh, ninth highest rating of all time. So um, you told me you're going to play in St. Louis, so I don't exactly know when that is, but that starts 24, but that will be even prior to that in the U S just taking some sort of vacations, doing some events afterwards and then going to St. Louis. Oh, okay. Uh, well, enjoy your, your travels to the U S I hope it's good. I hope obviously stay safe in this. Uh, I hope your luggage doesn't get lost in the airport, which seems to be a, <laughs> a, a, seems to be a huge problem right now. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, I have one direct flight, so it's already a good thing. I think. Yeah. I don't travel with uh, check bags. I just pack a giant backpack. This is how I travel. Um, I'm too, I'm too afraid of, uh, of losing my bags. Yeah. So. I, I don't have this, um, uh, commodity. When I travel for months, but yeah, makes sense. Well, uh, we'll be following your events. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure there will be some fun games. So we'll definitely be including uh, those games and recaps and whatnot. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time today. Yeah, great. Thank you, Levy. As always, folks, if you've made it this far in the recording, I'd like to say thank you very much for your continued support of my content. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you'd like to support me, the best way to do that is to find a donation link on Twitch or on YouTube or check out some of my courses at GothamChess.com. Until next time, I'll see you right back here in Gotham City with our next guest.